Um, so I was asked to give this talk today um, about the urban, urgent OBGYN patient, right? So that sounds very broad, and you might be wondering why we're talking about that when you know these are two different departments. Um, I think you'll see that there's a lot of overlap. Um, I'm sure you've come across these patients many times, and there may be situations where you don't always have an OBGYN to refer to or may not be at the point where you think they need a referral. And so we're just going to briefly go over some pretty basic topics, but in a nice and organized fashion to help you kind of uh, navigate that. I have no financial disclosures. So what is the urgent OBGYN issue? Um, there are many. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the not very pregnant, maybe a little bit pregnant woman um, who's coming in with either vaginal bleeding, abdominal pelvic pain, or a woman who is postpartum. I'll talk about a few issues there. For a majority of this talk, we're going to be focusing on those that come in with vaginal bleeding. I think those uh, tend to be the most common and also have the widest uh, range of differentials. So this is something you do all the time, just your basic stepwise approach to um, any woman who comes in or any of your patients that come in. Um, and really what we're focusing on here is getting a good history that encompasses some of the questions that you may not normally ask that are generally um, kind of focused in on more with the OBGYN department. That's not to say you don't ask them. I think probably your history and physicals are a lot better than coming out of our clinic. Um, but sometimes when you have um, certain issues that present, you may focus on other things or other comorbidities or what they were there for, if it's their diabetes or their hypertension, and less on some of the other complaints. So a woman comes in, her chief complaint is vaginal bleeding. How you manage her is going to depend on a range of factors that you can see there, including her age, whether she's pregnant, how chronic or severe her bleeding is, any comorbidities she may have. So these are all things that um, we're going to go over. So briefly, just very quickly on her history and physical, and this is just to kind of triage her, we're going to assess her volume and duration of bleeding. So this is trying to quantify her total or ongoing blood loss. As you know, what's normal for a woman is different. You know, some women will bleed very little. Some women, the nor their normal is to bleed very, a lot. Um, a large amount of bleeding does not necessarily mean that they're in an urgent situation, but it can help to triage what's going on with them. You'll ask them how many pads or tampons they've used, whether they were saturated, the presence or absence of clots, how long this has been going on. Typically, women will change their pad or tampon every three hours, but again, every woman has their own uh, normal. So it's trying to assess what's normal for them and then what's different. Getting a detailed menstrual history, so finding out have they been amenorrheic. Some women may not realize they are pregnant. Ask them, if, are you pregnant? They might not think about it until you ask that, and it kind of triggers, and they do some counting, they look at their calendar, and they say, oh, that's a possibility. Your obstetrical history, especially um, any history of surgeries or abnormal pregnancies, terminations, history of other topics, whether it was surgically or medically managed, and any history of pelvic infections. Also associated symptoms, obviously their vaginal bleeding can come from a variety of things, not just early pregnancy. So looking for fevers, chills, urinary symptoms, discharge, lower abdominal pain, um, and midline crampy abdominal pain. That can help you kind of differentiate what, what system that you're working with. Is it maybe coming from the bladder, the bowel, uh, uterus, tubes, ovaries? And then your physical. So obviously, you know, when you're doing your initial physical, not, not, not going into the whole OBGYN exam just yet, but finding out initial vital signs, blood pressures, is there any change? Um, a lot of women will come in with one blood pressure and you check it later and it's much lower. That should be a sign to you of maybe a, a weakness, dizziness, syncope, you know, uh, internal bleeding is a possibility. And then a very brief abdominal and pelvic exam. So your abdominal exam, looking for localized tenderness, peritoneal signs. This will give you a sense of urgency. Is this something that needs to be dealt with immediately, sent to the emergency room, consulting with a gynecologist, or is this something that can be watched or follow up the next day or two days later? Um, a lot of these things are obvious, but I think kind of figuring out those nuances can let you know your timeline of when you need to be working on this. Is this something that someone needs to see today, which may be a lot more difficult, but if it's necessary, it's necessary? Or is this someone that can follow up tomorrow or two days later? And just being able to figure out that can help you triage these patients. 
your pelvic exam, obviously, you're looking for your source and your volume of bleeding. So source, you know, a lot of times when people have vaginal bleeding, we assume it's coming from the uterus. We assume that if she's miscarrying or something like that, it could be coming from the cervix. It could be coming from the vagina. She could have foreign body signs of trauma, products of conception at the cervix when you look inside. Um, and if it's unclear still, you look inside, there's no bleeding at all. It could be coming from somewhere else. It could be rectal bleeding. It could be coming from the bladder. So these are all um, things to think about. Briefly, your ancillary tests, starting with your urine pregnancy test. Um, a lot of times you may not think to do, I know this seems obvious, but you may not think to do it. If someone comes in, they tell you, I'm having my period right now. It may not be a period. It may be an abnormal uh, pregnancy. That's She's having bleeding. And that's what we're going to be talking about in a moment. So unless she has a confirmed pregnancy, any woman who comes in with complaints of vaginal bleeding or strange uh, abdominal pain should be ruled out for pregnancy. A positive pregnancy test, you follow up with an ultrasound to assess for the pregnancy. And a normal IUP can generally be visualized around the fifth or sixth week of pregnancy. So with your pelvic ultrasound, if they're, again, if, they are, if you assess that they are pregnant, if there are less than 20 weeks, every woman gets that ultrasound um, to figure out what's going on. If they're over 20 weeks, it may or may not help you as much to figure out where the bleeding itself is coming from. Um, obviously, it would be done to assess for fetal assessment. Um, it can help for diagnosing a placenta previa, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it's less sensitive for some of the other causes of bleeding, of trauma, or if it's an abruption, you may or may not see it. For a non-pregnant woman, I mean, I'm sure you'll, you know from your OBGYN colleagues, they always want to get an ultrasound. Yes, it's helpful, but it may not help in the urgent situation. So generally, you will try and manage that urgent situation first, and it'll be more helpful for their long-term management. Um, if they're coming in with a primary complaint of pain, however, uh, ultrasound usually can be more helpful to assess whether or not it's ovarian or pathology. And then your blood tests. We talked about the urine pregnancy test, but a quantitative beta HCG, which we're going to uh, I'm going to go over much more in detail in a moment, is can help to decide whether or not this is um, a normal pregnancy or not normal pregnancy. Other basic blood work, if you're drawing blood work, CBCs, a type and cross, if you think that there's a possibility she's going to need a transfusion or at least a type and screen, RH antibody status if she's pregnant, and a coagulation profile if she has um, any indication for that. So in your differential, you can basically split it up between your life-threatening and your non-life-threatening causes. Um, Life-threatening, we are talking about less than 20 weeks pregnant at this point. Your highest on your differential should be ruptured ectopic pregnancy. That is one of the most life-threatening causes um, and is a common cause of death uh, globally. Maybe not so much uh, nationally, but globally. Um, retains products of conception does have the potential to be life-threatening if left alone, especially if there's any signs of infection, if it becomes necrotic, can lead to sepsis or toxic shock. Also, if you have retained products that are not coming out, it can lead to hemorrhage. It does, uh, the uterus cannot contract pro uh, properly, and if you, that, they have persistent hemorrhage, that could be life-threatening. And any complications of pregnancy termination. So this is less common uh, in areas where abortion is legal. Um, however, uh, in places where abortion is not legal, or as a possibility even here at some point, we don't know, this could be, you could start to see an upswing of this. If abortion services are limited, they, you might start to see complications of pregnancy termination. Uh, this being people trying to do it themselves at home or with an with un, unskilled provider. Over 20 weeks, you, know, you won't be seeing this as much, but again, I mean, as you know, I'm sure you've seen in your clinic, as we've seen in our clinic, sometimes women will come in over 20 weeks pregnant, she's 30 weeks pregnant, oh, I didn't know I was pregnant. And so she comes in with bleeding, really life-threatening causes that potentially to herself or to her fetus that would require immediate transfer to labor and delivery would be signs of placental abruption, placenta previa, uterine rupture. So all of these generally will present with um, vaginal bleeding. Abruption tends to be very painful and with contractions. Um, placenta previa will generally not be painful. They will have painless vaginal bleeding and it can be catastrophic, the amount. Uterine rupture, rupture is much more rare. Um, generally, this is someone who has had previous C-sections before, um, who is laboring, so they'll generally recognize their signs of labor, but it's always a possibility, especially or if they came in after trauma. And postpartum hemorrhage. So postpartum, most women know to go to their OBGYN, but if someone may not. Someone may think they're in the clear and they have a delayed postpartum hemorrhage. They're bleeding um, a bit more after uh, a delivery than they should be. 
other life-threatening causes. Now we have ruled someone out for pregnancy. Um, they're less, but they're, they're still possible in acute severe menorrhagia. So generally people who have heavy bleeding, menorrhagia or dysmenorrhea, something along those lines, um, they will usually be managed before it gets to this point. But like we said, everyone thinks has their own normal. And some women they may think that they're okay. They're just, they've always had heavy periods and may not realize how much blood they're losing. Also trauma, including sexual and physical abuse, and, and this is also true for uh, pregnant women. So uh, signs of um, physical abuse or domestic abuse is actually um, increased during pregnancy, so that should be something to think about um, for someone who may not have started her prenatal care or yeah, it shows up with you or something like that. And then there's your common like, non-life-threatening causes for vaginal bleeding. These are no less important. Um, some of them are quite serious, such as ovarian torsion or ruptured cysts, but they generally are not life-threatening. So this would be the difference of having her follow up with an OBGYN a day or later on that day or sending her to the emergency room. And by age, uh, you can generally figure out these non-life threatening causes by age, whether they're pre or postmenopausal, and give you that differential. Um, you can read that. I'm not going to go too much into that because I want to get to the crux of this talk. So this would be our diagnostic approach. A few simple questions to figure out right from the start. Is this patient hemodynamically unstable? Right from there, does she need to go to the ER now? Does she need to start being resuscitated? Um, figuring that part out. Is she pregnant? And if yes, is it less than 20 weeks or more? And if she's not pregnant, what is the important, most important diagnosis to consider in that, different, in that age group? So this is an algorithm that is used. Um, it's a bit busy. You don't have to go through all of it. This is up, more, more often used in the emergency room setting. But again, if you look at the top, it's asking basically just exactly what those three questions identify. Is she stable or not? If no, that whole uh, right-hand side of the algorithm usually will get sent off to the ER. If she's stable, then is she pregnant? Yes, okay, is she less than 20 weeks or more than 20 weeks? And then depending on that, we would go over what you would do at that point. Um, I'm going to be spending most of this on vaginal bleeding less than 20 weeks. I'll briefly go over all the others at the end, but this, I think, is probably where they're most likely to come to you um, in your practice. So in an early pregnancy, less than 20 weeks will generally fall under one of these three categories. Either it's a pregnancy of unknown location, meaning it is early. Like we said, we can normally see an IUP at five to six weeks, so usually it'll be around less than that. We don't know where it is yet, or you do a quick assessment and it's not easily visible. It's an intrauterine pregnancy. That doesn't mean it's a normal pregnancy. It could be, but it is, could be a missed abortion, which is basically a miscarriage that hasn't come out yet. Could be a spontaneous abortion, which is a miscarriage either in process or completed. An inevitable abortion, this is generally uh, similar to a missed abortion, but the cervix is open. So still inside, generally you have a heart rate here, whereas in a missed abortion you don't. And um, inevitably they will miscarry, so it will transition into a spontaneous or a threatened abortion. So this is a normal pregnancy. This is not, there's nothing wrong with this pregnancy, but she had vaginal bleeding, and it may be significant. And these women are at an increased risk of having a subsequent missed abortion. And the third possibility is an ectopic. So a pregnancy of unknown location. So if the location or the viability of the pregnancy is uncertain, a stable patient can be discharged. This is not necessarily an urgent issue. This could be a normal pregnancy that you just can't see yet. Typically within 48 hours, they'll follow up for evaluation and blood work, and we're gonna go over um, that algorithm a bit more when we talk about ectopics, because these, um, these are basically what you'll hear us call as rule out ectopics. They may be normal pregnancy, but our ectopic is our most life-threatening of the possibilities, so that's highest on our list, even though it's not as common as a normal pregnancy. Um, here we see, I want to just want to quickly show you the picture on the left, that ultrasound. That's basically a normal pelvic ultrasound. We see our cervix, our uterus, and normal endometrium, but this woman is pregnant. So just because there's nothing in the uterus doesn't mean it's an ectopic. Um, that's the adnex on the right. We see an ovary, that little black circle you see is a follicle. At this point, it looks like a, just a normal GYN exam. The next possibility is an intrauterine pregnancy. So you do your, you've done your pregnancy test, you do your ultrasound, and you see it is in the uterus. But you can't quite, now we're trying to assess, you can't quite tell if it's viable. So a non-viable IUP will sometimes just look like a regular pregnancy, but we don't see a heart rate. 
Um, or it will look kind of like that picture on the top where it just there's a lot of blood clots and other products of conception inside the endometrium. This is someone who's miscarried. So your decision to intervene or the urgency of this follow-up would depend on her hemodynamic status, her, whether she's anemic, how much she's actively bleeding, um, the content of the cavity, and the patient preference. Some women will want someone to help them take care of it. They want a DNC or they want medication to help them do it. And some women want to pass it on their own. Spontaneously miscarrying on your own without intervention is a uh, completely uh, acceptable option if they're stable. And then the picture on the bottom is a normal pregnancy. So this is what we was someone who had a threatened abortion. She came in with significant vaginal bleeding, but on ultra, her cervix is closed. She's not actively bleeding. And on ultrasound, we see a viable pregnancy with a heart rate. Now ectopic. This is what a majority of this talk is. So an ectopic pregnancy is diagnosed or suspected if you, you should get, obviously, a GYN consultation, if you have any suspicion that this is an ectopic pregnancy. Um, the reason we're going to go into it in length is sometimes you may not have a GYN available, or sometimes maybe it's Friday night, and even though here we have GYN 24-7, you may be working at a place where you don't, um, or where you have to make phone calls and do the pre-assessment beforehand. Or, you know, you may think they're, or they may be stable at that point, and you want to at least get the process started. Um, the first thing to assess, and I'll probably say this a couple of times because it is so important, that a ruptured ectopic is a surgical emergency. So if there's any indication that it is ruptured, even if she appears stable, that's a surgical emergency. It should go to the emergency room uh, immediately. So you have to assume these patients are, if not in hemorrhagic shock or from the internal bleeding, that they are at risk for it. Um, remember, these are young reproductive age women. A lot of times they may bleed significantly um, before they even have any signs and symptoms. Um, I've done Surgery, surgery for ruptured ectopics, where the woman was laughing, she looked fine, but it was clearly a ruptured ectopic on ultrasound. She had a little bit of pain. We go inside, and there's a liter and a half of blood in, in the abdomen. Um, this can happen. They will be fine, fine, fine until all of a sudden they're not. They generally don't have a gradual decline. They will decline like that. Um, for a woman who is stable and has no signs of rupture, if we think this is unruptured or we don't know whether it is or not, um, these women can generally be followed to figure out, you know, which diagnosis she has based on her preference, her reliability, the ultrasound findings, and this would be in consultation with the gynecologist. So how do they clinically present? Generally, an ectopic pregnancy, now this is someone who's not obviously, you know, bleeding internally and, and decompensating in front of you. Just your average ectopic, she'll come in with first trimester vaginal bleeding, and abdominal pain. They can also be asymptomatic. Um, generally, these are the symptoms you'll see, but it's not 100%. Clinically, they typically will have these symptoms about six to eight weeks after the last menstrual period. Not always. It can be before, it can be after, but that's the average. Um, and usually, they come in with other signs of being pregnant, so breast tenderness, um, nausea, vomiting, uh, cramping. Um, there have been studies that have shown that this is the most common sign that you'll see. Um, and a, when, but that being said, with women with these complaints, about 20% of them ha have been diagnosed with an ectopic. So that's not an insignificant number. That's a lot of women. But that also goes to show you that 80% of the time it is not an ectopic. So trying to kind of assess and gauge her risks, can, you can figure that out based on her history and her subsequent follow-up. So... Her clinical presentation of vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain, these can vary. Um, there is no pathognomonic amount of vaginal bleeding or pain that these women will have. Some women will have just spotting. Some women will come in hemorrhaging. Some women will come in thinking they're having their period. They may not realize that this is that they're actually having a topic or a miscarriage or something. Their pain can be generalized or it can be significant point tenderness. Um, generally, with a rupture, they will have severe acute onset pain at the time of rupture, um, and it will be localized to the area of rupture, generally one of the fallopian tubes. That being said, um, as you know, tubes and ovaries move around. Sometimes it's on top of the uterus, sometimes it's under, so their pain may be a little bit different. So we're going to take a stepwise approach to how to manage these ectopics or unknown, if it is ectopic or not, patients that are stable for follow-up. So step one, as we said before, you get your history. 
menstrual history, risk factors specifically, history of ectopics before, history of IVF, history of using an IUD. Pregnancy, even though it's uncommon with an IUD, can happen, and if it does happen, it's, it, it's more likely to, it's at a higher risk to be an ectopic. For medical and surgical history and obstetrical history, this is important to kind of be able to then subsequently triage how to manage these patients. This is the stable patient I'm talking about. Some patients may have contraindications to medical management. Some patients may be very poor surgical candidates. We want to catch them early and treat them medically before they get to that point. So trying to be able to figure that out. And the serum beta HCG level. So from a single level, you might not be able to determine whether this is a normal pregnancy. Um, generally, we talk about the trend, which is what I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but a single level can give you some indication of what you should expect. If you should expect to see it on ultrasound or not, if you should expect to see a kicking baby in there or a very early pregnancy. Normally, your HCG level can be detected in the serum or urine about up to, uh, as early as eight days after the LH surge. This is about 21, 22 days after her last menstrual period in a woman who has normal cycles. So that's why it's important to find out what their normal menstrual cycles are like, because some women may have 32, 33 day cycles. That might be their norm. Not everyone is uh, at a 28 day cycle. The HCG concentration in a normal IUP will generally uh, rise in a curvilinear fashion until about 41 days gestation. And then it kind of goes a little bit more slowly until a peak at about 10 weeks. And then it does decline. So if she comes in with a beta of 100,000 and then it goes down to 80,000, that doesn't mean she's miscarrying or this is an abnormal pregnancy. She may be past 10 weeks. She may have reached her peak and is now kind of plateauing and lowering her, her, her uh, beta HCG. So the reason that's important is because sometimes we will find that people will kind of indiscriminately check HCGs on anyone who's pregnant. It's really most useful in those first 10 weeks. Um, again, some women might not know their gestational age. Sometimes it's hard to assess what the first 10 weeks are. But in that first trimester is when HCG level is helpful. Past the first trimester, it generally is not. Step two, you want to evaluate her hemodynamic stability. So this will just to tell you whether or not she can stay here with you and start your workup or whether you can send her out. Again, young patients may not exhibit um, unstable vital signs until they've lost a large volume of blood. So you should suspect rupture in anyone who comes in with maybe severe persistent abdominal pain, rapid bleeding, or signs or um, you know, vital signs or orthostatic changes, something that kind of gives you an indication that she's bleeding more than she should be, but may, may not be externally, maybe internal bleeding. In the ED, I'm sure you've heard of the, the FAST ultrasound. This is often used for trauma patients, focus assessment for sonography of trauma. This is something we may do for someone who, you know, we have, we don't know why she's decompensating. She may not even be bleeding that much. Maybe they don't even have time to get a pregnancy test. Maybe she came in from a motor vehicle accident. Checking to see, is there signs of intraperitoneal bleeding? Just to give you a quick indication of, does this, do we think this woman is ruptured? Step three, assess, assessing your pregnancy location. So this is probably the most trickiest and sometimes does require some patience. Um, a lot of our patients sometimes will be very frustrated if at the first evaluation we can't tell them where the pregnancy is. And it's a matter of explaining to them that sometimes it does require follow-up if they're stable. And... Um, a combination of blood work, an ultrasound, and clinical exam to kind of figure out that picture. An ultrasound alone, without HCG measurement, can exclude or diagnose an ectopic only if you have findings diagnostic of an IUP or diagnostic of an ectopic. So what does that mean? That would be a gestational sac, either inside the uterus or outside the uterus, with a yolk sac or embryo. So if I see a gestational sac with a yolk sac or a fetal pole or a heart rate in her tube or her ovary, that is an ectopic. If I see something that looks like a gestational sac in her ovary without those things, that is not diagnostic by itself of an ectopic. The reason why is that you may have cysts that look like ectopics, corpus luteum cysts. A lot of women form, 20% of women form corpus luteum cysts on their own anyway, um, so they may have that. Um, and it may look like an ectopic, except it doesn't have a gestational sac or a yolk sac. Um, a pseudo sac can also form inside the uterus. So you may say, oh, she has a pregnancy, they saw a sac in the uterus. Well, you may, it may just be this little fluid blood-filled uh, sac that appears in the endometrial cavity. It just looks like a gestational sac. Some pictures, the one on the left, this is a normal gestational sac. Um, that by itself would not be a diagnosis of an IUP, but would give you an indication that maybe it could be. 
On the right, here we see this has a yolk sac. So now we know this is not an ectopic. Now I'm excluding the possibilities of a heterotopic, which we'll talk about in a minute, but much more rare. Yolk sac, gestational sac in the uterus. I'm not worried about an ectopic anymore. Now I can follow her just like a preg an intrauterine pregnancy. Now we're comparing that to the one on the left. Now here you saw your yolk sac, small little circle. Doesn't look that much different than this one, the early pregnancy failure. This is an empty, enlarged sac. The important point to say here is that just because you see a yolk sac here doesn't mean it's a normal IUP now. Now we know it's an IUP. We don't know if it's a normal IUP. It could be a missed abortion, a miscarriage basically that hasn't come out yet, early pregnancy failure. Yeah, on this one, on these ones? Yeah, okay. So this one, here we have the yolk sac. So we have our gestational sac. Um, when you're seeing the images, I mean, oh, it doesn't make sense as well, but when you're seeing the images, it usually is a little bit more clear, but not always. Sometimes you will see radiology reports that say, like, questionable yolk sac or something like that. That's why they're saying that, because sometimes it may not be as obvious. And especially if you're comparing it to something like this. So how do you know if it's a yolk sac or um, an, a pregnancy failure, an empty, enlarged sac? The picture on the right is a pseudo sac. So this picture makes it seem like it's obvious. You see some gynecologists look at it and be like, oh, obviously I knew it's a pseudosac. It's, it's thin. It's not well-rounded. It's just like a little blip in there. It doesn't always look like that. Sometimes it looks like this, the one on the left here. So you always have to have to keep that in mind. Generally, it's smaller. Generally, it's irregularly shaped. Not 100%. So that was, I think, we talked about what was diagnostic with just ultrasound alone. Now, say you have findings that are, we have findings that are suggestive. So if you have these, it is most likely an ectopic, but it's not 100%. So if you have an extra ovarian adnexal mass, that's generally seen in about 90% of ectopic cases at some point. It may not be initially, though. And if you have signs of a fluid in the cul-de-sac um, or in the abdomen, that could be consistent with rupture. So here we see a picture of the ovary, and that large thing on the right-hand side is an ectopic. But again, these are suggestive, not diagnostic, because there is no gestational sac or yolk sac inside that ectopic. It's just this mass on there. It strongly looks like one. It generally, in real time, with the radiology, they'll tell you things like ring of fire. That's basically Dopplers that they use outside of the uh, ectopic. Um, we have had cases um, that have gone through RQI where we've treated someone for an ectopic based on one ultrasound that looked like this with a ring of fire, and it turned out to be a normal pregnancy. So it's really important for patients who are stable to find out their um, their preferences and whether or not they want treatment or whether they want to follow up. And following up a stable ectopic is a good option um, as long as they are reliable to follow up and you, and you keep a very close eye on them. And we, we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, <clears throat> if a transvaginal ultrasound is non-diagnostic, that might be because the gestation is just too early. So if you don't see anything or if you see something in the, in the adnexa that shouldn't be set off, you know, panic alarms, it could just be that it's, you just don't see it yet. It's, it hasn't reached a level of uh, gestation for us to visualize. So again, this goes to show you another picture of why it can be so confu confusing. The little circle with the E in it is an ectopic. Next, the little thing with the O in it is a corpus luteal cyst. And you can see how they look basically identical. The ectopics generally in real time tend to have a little bit more of an echogenic surrounding tissue. They had tend to have more vascularity that can be um, suggestive of an ectopic. Corpus luteals um, will have a thinner wall, generally don't have that type of vascularity, but on just a quick visualization, it may not be obvious, especially if you're doing a bedside ultrasound or an ultrasound in the emergency room. So how do you figure it out then? <laughs> That's, I guess, the big question. You will, use your, you will use your ultrasound in combination with your HCG level. So an HCG discriminatory zone is the level above which a gestational sac should be visualized within the ultrasound, within the pregnancy, within, I'm sorry, the uterus, if it is an intrauterine pregnancy. So in most institutions, we use 2,000. Um, a lot of research has now been done that has shown that that may not be 100%. At 2,000, you should start thinking we should start seeing something in the uterus. Um, but it, it's not 100%. So we strongly recommend not intervening on one measurement of 2,000 and not seeing anything in the uterus unless you have other uh, signs and symptoms to suggest an ectopic. 
Uh, again, a lot, some, a lot of data is showing now that, that it should maybe be increased to 3510. Um, and we'll talk about those numbers in a moment again. If you're, that's for transvaginal ultrasound. So that's a lot more sensitive. For a transabdominal ultrasound, you know, some women will refuse a vaginal ultrasound or something like that, you will not see something inside the uterus until about 6,000. So you can see why that's, we really want to do a transvaginal ultrasound if we're thinking of ectopic, because at a level of 6,000, this ectopic would have been visualized much earlier vaginally. It's important to note, though, that the HCG levels can vary a little bit, and this is not 100%, and it's not always reliable. Um, you don't want to treat someone inadvertently, as I just told you about that one case, so your decision to treat should usually not be based on just one value. Um, it also can vary by institution. So if somebody comes to you with the beta level and you get another level, you can make some comparison, but it's, it's not really as reliable as if the two blood work uh, were done in the same place. So it, you'll hear a lot of, you may speak to some of your GYN residents or something like that who start talking about 1500. 1500 is generally when we will start trying to really look for it because you should start to see something, but 2000 is the number I would say for you to go by. Um, in uh, many women, by 99% of them, you will see it at 33,510, 3, so that's really why that number is now being pushed. But 90% of the time, you should see it at 2,000, so um, that gives an indication of why we use those numbers. There's also can be some variation of the discriminatory zone based on, like I said, the lab that you use, but also the skill of the sonographer, so whether it is the you know, the first year GYN resident in the ER doing it, or whether it is the skilled uh, ultrasonographer or radiologist looking at it in the, in the radiology suite, quality of the ultrasound equipment, the presence of other factors, if she had fibroids that could be hiding it, she's very obese, which makes ultrasounds more difficult, or other comorbidities. So what we do with that HCG, she comes in with an HCG, now we think she's stable, and maybe it's below the discriminatory zone or around there. How do we assess whether this is a normal pregnancy? So we trend it. We follow these women serially, generally every 48 to 72 hours. Um, here you'll see generally we do 48 hours because many of our patients may not be as reliable. We want to keep a very close eye on them. But in a lot of institutions, you'll see 72 hours, which is not incorrect. That is, that's probably, if anything, more sensitive. So uh, what we were looking for is in two days, in 48 hours, we want to see at least a 66% increase. Um, that's you, the number that has been quoted for a long time. And just like the discriminatory zone, that number is now also being challenged, as always happens in medicine. And a lot of studies have now shown that even with an HCG rise of 35%, you can start to consider these as potential IUPs. Anything less than 35%, this is not a normal pregnancy. 35 to 66, I know it's a wide range, but those ones, you would make your decision on whether or not to continue following them or to treat them based on other factors, patient preference, your risk factors for topic, ultrasound findings. Um, what we, a lot of time you'll just hear people say it should double in two days, that's not exactly accurate. If it doubled in two days, this is definitely a normal pregnancy, but at least the 66% is what we look for. Um, just this little graph down here is basically showing you the beginning portion of that other graph I showed you before. So you'll see that in the beginning there is no variation, it doesn't go up and down, it just goes up. So if at any point it starts to go down, this is not a normal pregnancy, or not a normal viable IUP. So how do you manage them clinically? If it's below the discriminatory zone, her beta is 200. Um, you follow, and she's stable. And we're all talking about patients who are stable. You follow them. You repeat to follow the trend, most commonly in two days. They repeat beta HCG. If it is rising normally, so we see a greater than, here we use greater than 66% in two days, but like I said, there are now studies that are coming out that says 35% in two days or double in 72 hours. To be on the safe side, I'd say anything less than 66% you start getting that gynecologist involved or other issues. If it's rising normally, you can stop following her with doubling. We have some of our residents who are trying to be very, very careful. They see a normal doubling or 66% or rise, and they just keep bringing her back every two days, and double and double and double. And I, I just, I tell them, like, are you going to follow them until they're in kindergarten? Like, we have to stop at some point. You follow them once. You see that it doubles appropriately. You're no longer worried. Second time at most. 
and then you can stop. You bring her back in when you suspect her HCG level will be about 3,500, um, and you should start to see it in ultrasound then. So you'll, we normally will say, okay, come back in one week, and we'll do an ultrasound. If it's rising, but not normally, and again, I'd say three measurements because of that uh, variation in 35% to 66%, but again, you can do it after two measurements, and you'll see that we do often treat here after two measurements. That's consistent with an abnormal pregnancy. That doesn't mean it's an ectopic, but it's something's abnormal. It could mm -hmm. be a missed abortion. So for these, you repeat the ultrasound. So you want to confirm whether this is an intrauterine pregnancy or an ectopic. Sometimes you'll see those ultrasound sign findings we talked about before. If there's an extra ovarian mass now, even that questionable extra ovarian mass versus corpus luteum mass, if you see that, even though it's just a suggestive finding, but that in conjunction with now an abnormally rising IUP is an ectopic until proven otherwise. And if you don't see an extra ovarian mass, that puts you in a trickier situation. You can either continue to follow them and now get one more measurement, and if it's still not rising appropriately, treat them. Or if you think she needs management now, generally a gynecologist, you'll see some people, what they do is they do a curatage first or a scope just to kind of see, to see is it something in the uterus. <clears throat> if it's decreasing, so if her HCG was 200 and now it's 100, this is a failed pregnancy. So this is not generally an ectopic that we worry about rupturing. It could be a resolving ectopic, which generally you don't need to manage. Spontaneous abortion, um, or something called a tubal abortion, which can be uncomfortable and much less common, but doesn't need a surgical intervention. And in those women, you now still need to follow them, though. You need to make sure it completely resolves. We see her beta went down to 100. We can't just leave her alone. We have to follow her to see whether it goes down to zero or not. So these are the people that you'll see us bringing back every week until we think it's probably less than what you can see on a, a urine pregnancy, and we'll just get a urine pregnancy, and it's negative. If she doesn't want to follow up, generally I'll tell them, okay, in two weeks from now or one week from now, do a urine pregnancy test. We'll call you. You tell us what the result is. If it's still positive, we're, we're worried. Now, if it's above the discriminatory zone, so her beta HCG, if it's above 3,500, what do you do? You get an ultrasound, um, and you look for where the pregnancy is. At this point, if you don't see something in the uterus, you will see something in the annexa, and that will be an ectopic. Now, if it's in that weird zone, 2,000 to 3,500, or a little bit below 2,000, you don't see something in the uterus, and you don't see something in the, uh, um, in the, adnexal ma uh, in the adnexa, what do you do? You can repeat the transvaginal ultrasound and blood work in two days, if they're stable, and kind of assess. And at that point, you should definitely see it, and if you don't, that's an abnormal pregnancy. The reason why I say that is because there's always that small possibility of a multiple gestation. So say she has a beta of 3,000, right? And so I expect to see something, but I don't see something. I don't want to necessarily treat her on that, because what if she has twins? Twins have take a little bit longer or to visualize, because um, for a normal pregnancy at five to six weeks with a beta of 5,000, for twins, you would have at five to six weeks once you see it the beta would be like 8,000. So it takes a higher beta HCG to be able to see it. So step four, how do you now follow them? So these are most like, mostly for the women that we're now bringing back in two, day, two to three days. So you always want to counsel them at nauseum about risk of rupture. She may be stable now, but she may not be stable later. And there is really no way to tell what, which one of these women will just continue on with their topic sometimes for weeks, or which are the ones that will rupture two days from now. Um, you counsel them about the risk factors and if they want immediate management or if they're willing to wait. And if they're willing to wait, they understand that risks that if they start to have signs and symptoms, they need to present to an emergency room immediately. So any worsening abdominal pain, any abdominal pain really at all. Um, vaginal hemorrhage, if they're bleeding significantly changes. Signs of feeling dizzy, acute signs of anemia. Any of those signs, they should present. Um, in women with a susceptibility, Suspected ectopic, they should be counseled about any possible outcomes. So that being a viable pregnancy, a non-viable pregnancy, an ectopic, a ruptured ectopic, something that needs medical management, something that needs surgical management. So they understand the broad spectrum of what could happen. And that can be very frustrating for patients, to, especially ones that have desired pregnancies that want to know what's going on. 
for you to be able to tell them, I don't know if it's in the uterus or not. I don't know if it's viable or not. That can be very frustrating to them, but trying to make them understand that this is a process and it, it does require some patience. So briefly about rupture, diagnosis of rupture um, is will happen when the ectopic, where it's implanted, um, usually the fallopian tube, well, you'll see signs of rupture in that area. So they may have um, fluid in the peritoneal cavity, generally in the cul-de-sac. If they have a significant amount of bleeding, you may see it up, in, up near the liver. They can have abdominal pain. Um, they can have even shoulder pain if they have a significant amount of bleeding and it's irritating the diaphragm will eventually lead to hypotension and shock if left untreated. Sometimes they will have um, not those pain symptoms, but they'll just have some tenderness when you examine them, um, and peritoneal signs, so guarding or rigidity, and then you want to start to think that she has a surgical abdomen. And if someone undergoes surgery, sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell. The woman doesn't want to take a chance. She doesn't want to follow up. She wants to figure out what's going on. We do a scope, we look diagnostic laparoscopy, we look inside, and we can see the, the rupture, obviously, correctly visualized. So this is an ultrasound of a very obvious ruptured, or at least a significant amount of fluid. The top one, there's fluid in the cul-de-sac. Um, generally, this will be, uh, the radiology will tell you that it looks like blood clots. It doesn't look like clear fluid or just a normal peritoneal fluid. And then we see in the bottom picture, she has signs consistent with an ectopic pregnancy. In a asymptomatic woman, just so these we were all of these women were talking about something came in with some symptoms. Something started this whole process of following her every two days. In an asymptomatic woman, we do not generally screen them for an we, we screen everyone, but we don't generally do serial HCGs on them to rule out an ectopic. Um, the exceptions for this are people who have risk factors. So if they have a history of an ectopic, the history of tubal surgery, IVF reconstructive surgery, any of those things. And I say that because a lot of times women will be incidentally found to be pregnant and end up on what the residents have as their beta list, the people that they're following every two days. And that, I think, is a waste of resources and there's a lot of um, uh, concern to the patient. It's a lot of anxiety that could be avoided. If someone comes in for an asthma attack and has no complaints, uh, vaginal bleeding, pain, and this and that, and they're incidentally found to be pregnant with a beta of 1,000, you don't need to now follow them every two days. This is someone who... Just like she took a pregnancy test at home and found out she's pregnant. She can then follow up for prenatal care or um, for an abortion if that's what she wants. Um, it is important, though, to always talk to patients about the risk of ectopic. So if they have any signs and symptoms, those that would be a time to present. So this is, an al this is that same algorithm. This basically goes, and I can send this to you guys if you want, this basically goes over everything that we just talked about. So starting from the top, stepwise, figuring out whether she's hemodynamically stable or not. Doing the ultrasound, is it intrauterine, extrauterine, or non-diagnostic? And then the whole bottom part is what to do if it's non-diagnostic and how to follow them with their HCG levels. Treatment, I'm not going to get into that because I think that's probably outside the scope of what we need to do here, but just so you have an idea of what, what the GYN will be doing once they get this information, if it's an ectopic, they can either do medical or surgical. If it's a confirmed ectopic, they require management. It is very unlikely these will self-resolve, and if they do, it generally happens before you even diagnosed it anyway. It will be when it's very small. These will either be medically or surgically managed, medically being with methotrexate, which it does have some, uh, some people have contraindications to that if they have liver disease or something like that. Surgical management being a laparoscopic salpingectomy. Doing a salpingostomy where you just take out the ectopic and then fix the tube is much less in favor and is pretty much not really done anymore um, because it gets, that tube is basically useless. Um, there's no point in having a non-functional tube there, except for probably putting at risk for another topic there. Um, if it's a spontaneous abortion or missed abortion, you can do expectant management. These women don't need to have intervention if they are stable. Some women will pass it on their own. Some women will be diagnosed as having everything inside. Their cervix is closed. Nothing's coming out yet, but they want to pass it on their own. And they most likely will. We generally will follow them every one to two weeks to kind of see what's going on, and eventually at some point, about two weeks later, if it still hasn't come out, we encourage them to medical or surgical management. Medical management, we often use mesoprostol. That will help to basically induce an abortion, and surgical management being a DNC in the operating room or an MBA. An MBA can be done in the clinic or in the emergency room if it's an urgent situation. Um, it can be a little bit uncomfortable, but it's basically manual, it's a manual vacuum, it's aspiration removing the contents of the uterus. Or it could be a viable pregnancy, viable normal pregnancy, and you prefer her based on uh, after discussing options. 
So very briefly, I'm going to talk about the other scope of other vaginal bleeding. This will be much less because I really want to focus the majority of my time on those patients you're likely to see, those women who are under 20 weeks of pregnancy. So over 20 weeks, again, we're talking about possibility of placenta previa, placental abruption, or trauma. Any signs or symptoms of these are really anyone over 20 weeks that comes in with vaginal bleeding or abdominal pain, you're sending her straight to labor and delivery anyway. But these are the things that should be um, in your mind as possi possibilities. This picture of placenta previa here on the left. So all of this, just to point it out to you, this is her cervix. This is the normal cervix. This is the cold, this is the os, long. This is the pregnancy. This is the whole pregnancy. These are four parts of it. And this is the placenta. So this, all of this lymphoid area usually is either posterior or anterior or covered. <coughs> and here we see it's covering the internal os. Um, placental abruption is not, like I normally said before, it's not normally visualized on ultrasound. So this picture, it's nice, but you're probably not going to see this. Here we see that same placenta picture, and then behind it, between the, the placenta and the uterine wall, we see some blood and blood clots. Um, be, these are both obstetric emergencies. Um, these can be cause catastrophic bleeding um, to both baby and to mother, so uh, these are just things to keep in mind of how important these are. Um, also, just any woman who's bleeding um, over, to, over or under 20 weeks generally will do a typing screen. You get their RH status because they may be candidates for um, Rogam to protect future pregnancies. So in the non-pregnant woman, um, again, you just want to figure this out. Usually based on age is the higher, highest uh, differential. If they're premenarchal, premenopausal, or postmenopausal, you'll do your speculative exam, take a look at bleeding. I, I mentioned this before. Um, premenarchal, generally, none of these are life-threatening. None of these are urgent, urgent. These can probably follow up as an outpatient, depending on the level of stability. Premenopausal abnormal uterine bleeding, again, a lot of these are chronic issues. Um, they can have fibroids, they can have polyps inside, they can have adenomyosis, which is the thickness of the endometrial on um, the uterine wall. Um, most of these will not cause urgent, urgent bleeding that needs to be seen in the ER or in the clinic that same day, um, but does require management. And can eventually become urgent if it's not uh, if it's not addressed. So some women will just really let themselves hemorrhage, and then they come in and they're um, extremely anemic. Um, the ruptured ovarian cyst and ovarian torsion I mentioned there briefly. Generally, you'll see more of that with pain, less than bleeding. Um, these are generally not life threatening, but that doesn't mean they're not just as important. And the reason being is that this can now. Um, affect this woman's fertility. She could lose her ovary if you don't identify an ovarian torsion. So it's very, very important, but I think it's a topic for another lecture. Um, it's, it's something that they, you would also send this woman to the emergency room or at least have her follow up with the gynecologist, but it doesn't follow, fall as much into the abnormal uterine bleeding uh, genre. And the postmenopausal woman were worried about cancer. So most common being endometrial, but that being said, they can have uh, cervical cancer, other, other ovarian cancer can also come with bleeding. Um, they can have other comorbidities. One of the most common consults that we get in the hospital for a postmenopausal woman who's having new onset uh, bleeding is because she's on anticoagulation, and that if they already are atrophic, that can incite bleeding. And your disposition of them will depend on how much they're bleeding and um, if they're hemodynamically stable. So very briefly, um, I want to mention postpartum. So. Um, the reason I threw these in there is just because these, I think, are the two most likely things that you will be seeing or have a potential to see in your clinic and um, are obviously not recognized as much. They're not as in your face as vaginal bleeding, so they may be overlooked. So preeclampsia, so 5% of the time, preeclampsia is first recognized postpartum. Usually it is within 48 hours, but it can happen after two days or within six weeks of delivery. So this is... Generally, someone with new onset hypertension with proteinuria or with end organ dysfunction without proteinuria um, in a previously normal tense of women. That being said, you can have chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia. So you may be seeing someone two weeks after her delivery who always follows just you with her blood pressure and doesn't want to go to her OB, and now she comes in and she actually has superimposed preeclampsia because she has other signs and symptoms. So it's something to keep aware, keep aware that they have that possibility. Normal blood pressure does increase a little bit for women after delivery. That doesn't mean they have preeclampsia. That's a normal finding. About 20% of the time, you'll see blood pressure increase a bit. Um, and normally, it will normalize within four weeks and should resolve completely within 12 weeks. If there's three months, if they're six months after delivery and they come in with 
new onset blood pressure, this is probably uh, chronic hypertension. This is not preeclampsia. And other symptoms to look for. I don't know if that's my cue to be done, but I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> other symptoms to look for um, that will that will give you the red flags that it could be persistent pre uh, could be postpartum preeclampsia is a persistent headache, something that does not resolve normally with at all. Uh, visual changes, bright lights in front of their eyes, right upper quadrant pain. So we're actually worried about bleeding under the liver capsule, which is a, a sign of severe preeclampsia. Worsening, worsening edema or pulmonary edema, oliguria, stroke. Um, if you see someone, she may have had some symptoms, she doesn't have symptoms anymore, her blood pressures are borderline, you don't think she needs to urgently go to labor and delivery, but probably should follow up in a day or two with the OB. What is something you could do? You can get some blood work and some, and some testing. So CBC, creatinine, allergies, urine, protein. So what we're looking for here are signs of severe preeclampsia or HELP syndrome. Hemolysis, elevated liver, liver enzymes, or low platelets. Any of those things, with or without severe rage blood pressures, with or without symptoms, is uh, preeclampsia. So these generally will call serial monitoring. They'll either refer them to L and D, or they can just follow up with their OB if they're stable and something you're just trying to pull in or out. And then lastly, depression. Um, and this does not really go in line with a lot of the other ones. A lot of people don't think of this as a life-threatening thing. Um, it's not really that high in everyone's differential, but it should be something that you think about even within the first 12 months of birth. Um, a lot of the different diagnoses say that you should have major onset depression within four to six weeks, but that doesn't mean that she'll present to you in that time frame. So she may have had those symptoms then, but may not present to you until a couple months later. Most of the time, women will be diagnosed within the first month if they're followed, if they're seen, and if they present with those symptoms. Um, a lot of times it may not be recognized until two to four months, though. Generally, for screening here, we'll do the Edinburgh Depression Scale. This is something we do routinely. But again, if a woman doesn't follow up with her OB, this is something that you could take into your practice, too, if you see someone who's postpartum. Um, and generally, if they have, a, you use a cutoff of 10 and anything above that, so that you will refer them for uh, follow-up and treatment. And also just asking them questions. So if they have any intrusive thoughts about harming herself or her baby, does she feel down, helpless, depressed, she bothered or lost of interest or pleasure in doing things? These are all signs to you that you might require uh, further evaluation. And if there's any question, and maybe she answered the questions right, or the survey right, but there's you, you get a sense that something could be wrong, you could still send her for a referral and counseling and treatment just based on, um, you know, if she's accepting of it. So the signs for this would be basically screening, recognition, and referral for treatment. And this picture just shows to show you that they, they, there are not apps for this, and a lot of people have normal pregnancy apps, so they may even self-diagnose. So when I say this, for us ourselves, that when we screen, if we see someone that has a score above 10 or who we're concerned about, our social workers manage the um, women with postpartum depression and referring them for treatment. So we don't refer directly to uh, the psychologist or the, the team that manages them. They, um, they are funneled through our social worker. And that way our social worker is uh, involved with them when they go home as well. So we'll be calling them, making sure they show up to appointments, and basically coordinating their care. Um, they can be referred to our social workers from anywhere. Um, so if they are coming from somewhere else, you have someone that you're concerned for postpartum depression, you can refer her to us and we would bring her to... to Social workers are within our clinic, so basically within our clinic, we would take care of it. So key takeaways here, last slides. The urgent patient, as you know, can present herself in a variety of places and will often seek her primary care provider first. You may not see it as much here or, or as much in places where um, there's an OB clinic right on site, but sometimes women will just come to who they're most comfortable with, who, they, who their primary care provider is, who they follow with for their hypertension, their diabetes, other things. Um, so... They may present to you first, even though they have what may clearly be a GYN complaint. Consider an ectopic in anyone who is having bleeding and or abdominal pain um, who, until you've ruled out pregnancy, basically. Ruled out pregnancy until you've ruled out intrauterine pregnancy. In recognition of these women, identifying these key signs and symptoms can really lead to a quicker diagnosis and could be life-saving. So lastly, that's, that's it. Um, again, my name is here. I, Zelina Rafiq, who's actually sitting right here on the, on the front here, is the director of our clinic. Keisha Barnes is our admin manager. You can email any one of us if you're trying to get one of your patients in for something that you think is urgent, but not necessarily like today. It could be like tomorrow, or you think, oh, you know what, I think she should be seen within the next week, but when they call the call center, their appointment's you know, three months from now. You can always reach out to us here. I also included here the call center number. So if for some reason you just they just go through the call center, that's okay too. If you tell them you want it to be escalated, you want someone to um, like 
you know, well, my patient has an appointment that she could really just needs to be called earlier, they will send the message to us. So they will, if you tell the, if the patient tells you, I called and they told me a month later, if you tell them you don't have time to call and you tell the patient, call again, tell them you want them to email it, they will email it and you will get back to the patient usually within the next day or two. I also have the nurse's triage line number here. So that um, phone number goes directly to our nurses. So all of our walk-in patients or urgent patients that come in or that just get sent sometimes from IMA or from other places, they go through nursing triage before they see a provider. So this is an O number for that nursing triage person. So if you have someone you're planning on sending over or you think needs to be seen or you want to speak to the attending that's there that day, the, nurse, the nursing triage line is the way to go because they will then triage it and bring it mm -hmm. uh, they will connect you basically with the, the attending who's there. And then for routine, just to throw it in there just because I thought it might be helpful, the routine email address to make appointments. So if you have someone that you want to follow up within, not today, not tomorrow, but within the next week, within, you know, within a month, within five days, whatever, anything more than, anything more than tomorrow, because they may not get to it by then, is that email address. That is checked multiple times, probably 100 times throughout the day by three different registrars, and they respond to it. So they will reach out to the, if you give them the patient's name, MRN number, phone number if you have it, otherwise they can look it up. If sometimes, you know, the demographics are not accurate, and they will contact the patient and schedule the appointment. They will respond back to you and tell them that they reached the patient um, and that this is when she's scheduled for. So for your routine follow-ups that you are coordinating, that the patient's not coordinating herself, that would be the email address to use.